morning and welcome to High Peaks Church, home church, Facebook church. I'm not sure what we call it. We're still trying to figure it out, but uh, we're really glad that you're here today. We're glad that we can be here. It's a beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. Um, I'm just going to, we're going to start, I'm just going to give a couple of brief, brief announcements, catch up on what we're doing just quickly have a kids' church announcement, and then Chris and Hannah are going to lead us in a, a couple of worship songs, then we'll share a message. Uh, so our big thing is we're connecting, though we're not connecting. That's what we're trying to do. We're staying distant, but we're finding ways to connect. Uh, it's really important because connection is what the church is all about, so this is a challenge for us, but uh, so far, we're doing it. Uh, this is one way. Today we're, we're connecting via Facebook Live, but we also have Zoom groups, uh, life groups during the week. Right now we have three, and there may be another one starting uh, soon. So if you're interested in any of those uh, Zoom groups where you can uh, video conference, fellowship, study the word, uh, send us an email, highpeakschurch at gmail.com, and we'll connect you to those groups, or you can watch our Facebook page. Sometimes we post some of our uh, Zoom links up there also. But that's the idea, is to stay connected. And if you want to hear anything that we're doing here at High Peaks, shoot us an email, highpeakschurch at gmail.com, uh, and we'll do that. We're, we are finding opportunity to give back in the community food, uh, rent assistance, things like that are becoming more prevalent as a, as a church. So uh, we have online giving also. Just encourage you to check that out if that's something you're able to do. And kids, that's another big uh, part of what we do. Um, Miss Heather Bickford and others have put together, uh, H it's called HPC Kids. Uh, HPC Kids Church on Facebook. It's a group. And at 1 o'clock on Sunday, so they do a regular worship service there. I think maybe you'll see. I don't see it. But there's a video of some kids worshiping in front of their uh, computer or TV. Uh, so the kids gather at 1 o'clock. Uh, they worship together. And then from that page and from that uh, event on Sundays at 1, <clears throat> they uh, also have games and things going on during the week. Devotionals are giving away pizza, they're giving away different things, so that's HPC Kids Church, if you want to check that out. Something else for kids and families, we also have a, a lot of Jesus Storybook Bibles, we'd love uh, to give away to kids that don't have one, so uh, you can send us a message, send us a letter, however, and we'll send you one of those. And also families, we have this Grow at Home, uh, a beginner's guide to family discipleship which is something everybody's doing now uh, <laughs> and is really important. Uh, church is important and what we do in the church is important, but really how you disciple your family is, is vitally important. So this is just a really good tool and we'll send you uh, one of those also if you're a family and you don't have one. So yeah, that's, uh, that's our announcements. I, for now, I, I, I'm kind of free flow with my announcements, but I'm sure I missed something here or there, but uh, check with us, High Peaks Church at Gmail. We try to send out updates regularly there about what's going on in the church, etc. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite Chris and Hannah to come and uh, lead us in a couple songs. And where you're at, I believe the Holy Spirit is there and will minister to your family and to your heart. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your church. I thank you that you've given us this day to set aside, to gather in your name. And your promises is that you are in our midst as we gather. So I pray for your peace. I pray for your presence to touch each home, each life that is watching and listening today. Let your name be glorified through your church, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to invite Chris and Hannah. And then we're going to have a message following that. Upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. We will wait 
victorious. Our God, firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your worthy to be praised. I'm going to uh, take a moment, get myself ready here. I'm trying to keep this as much like our church experience as possible. Sometimes I lose my glasses, sometimes I lose my messages, but uh, keeping it real here. Thanks, Chris and Hannah. You know, there's something... If you don't know yet, just praising God is free. It frees our heart. It frees our spirit. It puts our perspective in the right place. And so uh, he is the only wise king. Amen. I heard you all out there say amen at that, I'm sure. Uh, so here we are. Once again, I'm going to share. We, we kind of, our, our goal on uh, with our live stream <coughs> is to not be too long, uh, but we realize there's a lot of competition out there, <laughs> on the, especially Sunday morning, um, but we're glad you're here, or maybe you're listening at Sunday evening or whenever it might be, but we do try to keep it a little shorter. I'm going to share a message. Uh, we, we've spent the last couple of weeks, of course, last week was Easter, and the celebration of the resurrection, and uh, with the circumstances that we're in in our world, it felt important to express why there's hope in Easter. Why, why is there such a thing as hope? And 
where does it take us and what's it all about? Because uh, a lot of things we have hope for in this life, <clears throat> like I hope, I hope I have a good lunch when I get home or whatever it might be, uh, those are fleeting. But the hope that we have in Christ is eternal. And that's why Easter has been celebrated so profoundly for thousands of years, because it's a living hope. And uh, so I felt it important for a few weeks to really kind of share what that means. And if knowing that there could be people not connected with our local body, or maybe not even familiar with some aspects of the Christian faith, uh, to share the simple gospel message that is, we need Christ, we trust in Christ for forgiveness of sins and for our reconciliation with our Creator. And when we trust in Christ, there's a, a, mir a miracle that happens by faith that changes us on the inside and causes us to live differently on the outside. And that is a life that is following Christ. And uh, what I'd like to say about that is, before I get into my message, <clears throat> if that's you, if you're someone who has heard this message, but you never, you don't really know if you've ever made that commitment to follow Christ, or you haven't experienced that deep sense of hope, and you have more questions, we would love to talk with you. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have a pastoral care. You could call for pastoral care. Uh, Chaplain Ingrid Johnson would love to talk with you, or I'd love to talk, or send us an email. Um, we would like to connect with you, and we're also uh, looking ahead to a online Christian basics uh, Zoom, which will be very basic, but it'll be an opportunity to ask questions and to learn more about this hope that is in Christ, this hope that causes us to gather on Sunday morning and sing songs to, to Jesus. So I want to encourage you in that. Uh, if, you're a, if you're someone who's still sorting it out, I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your life. I believe God is speaking to your heart. And what we really need to do in those moments is simply follow in obedience. Say, yes, Lord. Make a call. In investigate further. Uh, invite God to reveal himself to you. So I want to encourage you in that. And I'm going to share for the next few weeks um, I don't know, it from Jesus' last words before he went to the cross. Um, it's really John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. Um, and I said his last words were Jesus' vision for our lives, how he envisioned us living as his disciples. Uh, and so it's really a, a powerful passage section of Scripture, John, Gospel of John chapter 13 through verses 17. But I want to start today and read uh, kind of at the end. And then we're going to come back through it in the next few weeks and talk about what this all means. But in John chapter 17, uh, verses 18 through 20, uh, this is Jesus at the end of this uh, discourse, his, what some call his last will and testament, he prays. Uh, and some call this his high priestly prayer. And he's praying for the church. Uh, this is kind of the middle of the prayer that we have here, verses 18 through 20. But here's Jesus praying to the Father. He says, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And then the next slide said, the next verse, what's he praying? That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So this is Jesus' great prayer before he goes to the cross, his prayer of unity for his church. But just a couple things I want to point out quickly uh, in this prayer. Number one is, if we go down uh, to verse 19, he says, I do not ask for these only. So he's not, he said, I'm not just praying for these disciples that are with me today here in the garden. 
but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's encouraging because Jesus is praying for us way back then. Way back 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I'm not just praying for my disciples who've walked with me, but I'm praying for every person who believes in me because of their word. His, uh, he is our great high priest. I just want to go there and know that Christ is for us. He's for his church. He's in his church. He's active in his church, and he prays for his church. Uh, so be encouraged in that, that Jesus' prayer came to us even that long ago. The second thing is, is what was he praying? He was praying that all may be one, that we could all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Um, this is something that's a little more than that we're all figure out to learn how to agree to disagree. Uh, <laughs> It's something way deeper, and it has something to do with how the depth of my relationship with Christ, my commitment to Christ and his cause and who he is, relates to your commitment in Christ and your commitment to who he is. And in that place, there is a beautiful unity that Christ prays for for his whole church. It's far deeper than being doctrinally correct or doctrinally similar. It's something about relationship. That is vitally important. Doctrine is good. Doctrine is important. But somehow Jesus is calling us as his church to be those that know and love each other and are in Christ just as the Father was in Christ and Christ be in us, in all of us together. So it's a very powerful uh, prayer. And it's a very powerful thought because here's why, why he says he prays it. At the last verse here, the last line says, the reason he wants us to be one is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's why he prays for oneness. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I like to present the gospel every chance I can to tell the good news. Christ came to earth. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. If you believe on him, you shall be saved. We, we, we proclaim the gospel, and the gospel, that good news is the, the, the message that rings out through the world. But I do believe that as a church, as the church, <clears throat> maybe we've missed some of the importance of what Jesus prayed here in John 17. That somehow our relationships have almost as important part in the world understanding who Christ is than just being able to share the gospel. Sometimes we think we just... Okay, you heard the gospel, it's on you, which it is to some degree. <laughs> but there's this whole realm of how we as the church live together and in the world that is a powerful testimony for who Jesus is. So this is what we're going to talk about uh, as we go through Jesus' last words, beginning in John 13. He talks about how what it means to live like Christ, to abide in Christ, to be a part of Christ's body, uh, and how that reflects the ultimate goal is that the world may believe that you have sent me. <clears throat> so two other quick points. So Jesus prays, prays for us, prays for his disciples, prays that we would be one, and the reason is, is so that the world may believe that, you, that the Father has sent Jesus. Now I'm going to move down, or back a couple uh, in John 17, it's in the same prayer. And here's what Jesus says. This, this is just earlier in the same prayer. He says, I do not ask, my COVID hair is getting to be a little, uh, I wonder how all you guys look out there. <laughs> you guys get to see my hair grow every week. But uh, Okay, here's what Jesus prayed. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Oh, Lord, please take me out of the world, right? That's kind of what some people are saying right now. But Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what his disciples faced, which was probably a lot more severe than what we face. Uh, but he's praised to the Father. He says, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus has sent us into this world. <laughs> 
as much as we might want to get out. <laughs> this is where we're supposed to be. This is where he's called us. He's called us to be here. And he says, I don't ask that you take him out, but I do ask you to protect him from the evil one. And I don't believe that he's, and I'm not developing this thought too far, I don't believe he's talking about our physical protection. I believe he's talking about Satan trying to destroy the witness of Christ in our lives. I pray they're in the world, but do not let the evil one take them. Do not let the evil one take their uh, witness, their testimony. So Jesus understands that for us to be his church, we're supposed to be where we are. We're his representatives. We're in the world, but he's called us to be in the world and to shine a light in the world. Because that's what it says in the next, the next line. I've got to slow down a little bit. The next line here after it says that you keep them from the evil one, he says, they are not of the world, his followers, us, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Um, there's a lot to be said there, and I'm not going to go to, but the word of Christ and Christ himself is sanctifying us. When we profess Christ, when we believe on him, the living word, we're instantly a part of another kingdom. We're a disciple of Christ, and that makes us at some level separate from the rest of the culture and what's going on around us. The other part of sanctifying is it means that we're set apart. It means that we're doing things, we're living differently than all of the culture around us. Um, this is really a vital uh, thing for us to understand as a church, and especially in this day and age that we live in. <clears throat> um, I think Jesus' prayer that we would be one, Jesus' prayer that through our oneness we would be a witness, we'd be a testimony that Christ has truly come from the Father. And then he says the way we're going to do that is we're going to be in the world, but we're going to be separate. We're going to be sanctified. We're going to be separate. We're going to have a different path that we walk on as Christ followers. And as I said, Jesus' uh, last will and testament, his, his final discourse, lays that out for us. What it means to be a servant. What it means to abide in Christ. What it means to lay down our life. What it means to love one another just like Christ loved us. This is different than what the world is doing around us. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. That's why I'm titling this, this few messages, uh, Last Words. Jesus' vision for our life, for our lives uh, on this earth. So we're in the world, but we're different. We're called to be representatives of Christ. What sets us apart? Well, we have certain Christian practices. We do Facebook church. Uh, we do things like that. Uh, we have different lifestyles. Uh, but really, the thing that sets us apart is that we have determined to live our lives in the form and in the manner of Jesus. That's what baptism is about. Baptism says I am identifying with his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and I'm rising up to walk in newness of life. I'm following the path that Jesus has set for me. I'm talking to the church. I, I, I think this is so vital for us to get right now that uh, we're called to be on a different path. Uh, so so we, we're set apart. We're different. This life we live is vastly different than the culture, but we're in the world shining the light of Christ. Now, I just want to throw this in there uh, real quick. In the midst of this, Jesus gave, a, he talks about peace. He talks about the Holy Spirit in the midst of this uh, in John 14. So in the midst of his final discourse, he talks about peace. He talks about the Holy Spirit coming and being a comforter and teaching us In this world, for us to have peace, following Christ is the way that it happens. 
We have a lot of different things we can chase after, but it doesn't produce that lasting peace. And that's why Jesus, that's why this is his vision for our lives, that if you abide in me, if you put your hope in me, if you trust in me, I'm going to be your comforter. I'm going to be your counselor. I'm going to be the one who eases your burdens. Abide in me. So this is the path that Christ, his vision for our life in this world. You know, as we entered into this uh, isolation, this pandemic, what, what are we calling it? Social distancing. <laughs> um, someone over here said to me that when, uh, when this all started, people were kind of being nice to each other. There was kind of a softness and people were, uh, but it didn't take long. It seems like that's changed actually. <laughs> It seems like there's there's animosity, there's frustration, there's the the whole political thing is blowing up, and uh, I find that unfortunate. I find it unfortunate that there can't be a place where we can see our own personal and greater need without pointing uh, fingers at others. Actually, um, I'm sorry. I got to go back to my. And I, I think <clears throat> this is a hard thing. I, I, need, I need to say this in the right way. Uh, if we as the church live in the midst of this pandemic and this circumstance that we're in, without being a light, we're missing something. And if we're praying for God to intervene, simply so my life can get back to normal, I, I love a normal life. I like all that good stuff. But really, that's kind of misguided. We really need to hear from God and to be changed during this time. I think moments like this are moments where uh, culturally and as a society, we reevaluate our values. And as the church, we have to lead the way in that. Um, as I said, I'm trying to be careful what I say here. Um, I know that, here's what I want to say. I'll boil it down to this. As we saw this pandemic coming and the social distancing, the things that, things in our life <clears throat> getting pulled up and changed dramatically, and I'll admit I was guilty of this, there was a thought, okay, well, God's going to bring a revival. God's going to really, there's going to be a spiritual awakening in our nation, in our world, Things are going to change because the things of uh, this world are being uh, pulled out. They're being ripped out, the things that people have trusted in and hoped in. And I think we're looking for a spiritual awakening for someone else rather than us. That's my feeling. Church, that we kind of expect that God's really going to do something out there. God's really going to change that because we're, we're, we're doing pretty good, actually. I just want to get back to normal. I wonder if God really wants to do something different in us. If he really wants a spiritual awakening in the church. And the reason I, I connect this to John chapter 17, because Jesus said, in our oneness, in our ability to truly live like Christ and be surrendered to his purposes and to his will and uh, abiding in him as a church, in that place, the world sees. We're, we, we want the world to see in spite of how we live, actually. Uh, I usually don't, I'm really, uh, I'm not usually this forward, but I am being a little forward. <laughs> I just want to challenge us as a church, where is our heart? Are we looking for spiritual awakening for someone else? Or are we looking for spiritual awakening for us? Are we looking for this to be resolved so we can go back to the status quo? Or are we hoping that somehow our, our, the generations after us will learn a new path? We'll learn that there is more to life than the, the, the natural things around us, but there is a spiritual element that should uh, permeate all that we do. This is what I think Jesus' vision for our life, beginning in John 13, the first 
John 13, 1 says, having loved his own, he loved them to the very end. And then we get five chapters of Jesus talking about his vision for our lives, what he would like us to be. My challenge is, for the church, for myself, is to say, Lord, how do you want to change me during this time? How do you want me to come out differently? How do you want us as your church to be so different in our relations to one another that the world may believe that Jesus came from the Father? This is a powerful message. How does, how does Jesus, he prays that. He prays uh, that we would have that oneness. He prays that we would be in the world, but we'd be separate from it. It's not necessarily the natural things that we do, but it's the relational aspects of how we live our lives with one another and in a relationship to Christ. <clears throat> I think the opportunity before the church right now is will our lives be shaped by the culture or by his life, by Jesus' life? Will our lives be shaped by the culture or by his last will and testament? At some level, we pray, we ask for God for a way through this, but I think we need to pray and ask God, how do you want to change me during this time? We want to come out of this with a new understanding of how to live as Christ calls us to live, in the world, but very different. We want to be a model. We want to be an example of what it means to be a Christ follower in this world. Jesus, this was his high priestly prayer. So there should be John 17, and I just read a couple portions of it. <clears throat> There's pretty, there should be a lot of importance put, put on this prayer. As soon as, as soon as he finished his prayer in the Gospel of John, he was, he was off uh, to be arrested. So this prayer of unity, his heart for the church, the prayer was for unity. The path was abiding in Christ. And the goal was so that the world may believe. And so that's my prayer for us as a church. Let us learn during this time to abide in Christ. Let's not uh, enter into uh, blame, things of that nature, but rather let us abide in Christ. And let that be an example that leads the world around us in the truth of who Christ is. The church needs, <clears throat> the church needs renewal just as much as the culture needs renewal. Uh, that's my belief. That's my feeling. And for the culture to be changed and transformed, we need to be changed and transformed. We need to see how can we? How are you asking us to live differently, Lord? Um, so as we go forward, the next few weeks, we're going to look at all these things, which are very challenging things. It, it, beginning with Jesus stooping to wash the feet of his disciples. He's the leader, yet he's washing their feet. Jesus' vision for our life might be vastly different than what our vision is uh, for our life. So <clears throat> that's my prayer as we go forward, that we could catch his vision for our life, um, that we would, as a church, as the church, cause the world to see the glory of who Christ is. I'm going to close with uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I do want to say, uh, again, I said it at the beginning, uh, my hair is getting long. Uh, I said that again. I wanted to say it again. <laughs> I want to say, if you have spiritual need, contact us. We'd love to communicate with you. If you have questions, contact us. Check out our, our homepage or our Facebook page. Uh, but as a church, let's let Jesus, let's let his heart, his, his life, his spirit, his last words shape our lives in a new and a different way in the weeks and the months and the years to come as we go through this. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to read a, uh, from the Message Bible a benediction. 
And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit. I pray for your grace on your church. I pray that uh, we could learn, change, be transformed by your word. Bless each home, bless each life, each person that's watching today. I pray for your presence to go and to minister life and peace. And for this, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. I don't know if I'm still on or not, but thank you. Glad you were here. <laughs>